municipal election for sure and for being with us today. Um, today we'll be hearing from District 12, uh, located in Timberley, Beachville, Clayton Park and Westwood, uh, where Richard Zorowski is currently the incumbent. District 14, located in Middle Upper Sackville, Beaverbank, Lucasville, uh, and Lisa, uh, uh, Lisa Blackburn um, is currently is, is the incumbent in in, uh, in that district. I just, I'm reading these these notes incorrectly. Am I? Yep. Yep. I don't, yep okay. Um, sorry, Lisa. And uh, finally, District 15, located in Lower Sackville, where Paul Russell uh, is the incumbent. The Halifax Ac of Chamber of Commerce appreciates the time and effort that's required to run and become a councillor in Halifax. Also, I want to thank our viewers that are joining us today. We hope you're able to gain some valuable insights into your district councillors and ask questions that are relevant to you. Given the restrictions due to COVID-19, we were unsure whether candidates would be able to canvass through their districts as they normally would in a traditional uh, municipal election, um, potentially losing a bit of that personal touch of the campaign. So we thought that this would be another way that uh, people could reach out and, and, and get to know their candidates a little bit. Uh, the Halifax Chamber of Commerce knows how important the role of the municipality is to the success of our business community, and that is directly linked to the importance of our councillors and the decisions they make. We wanted to ensure our members and the community could hear from, hear from and ask questions of their district candidates. For those who don't know, the overall goal of the Halifax Chamber of Commerce is to create value and prosperity for our over 1,700 members. Through our 2019-2023 strategic plan, we are providing the service, services businesses need hosting virtual and in-person events that will help them learn and are advocating for the conditions in the economy that enhance their prosperity. Our two task forces, fostering private sector growth and accessing a skilled workforce, are currently working towards that goal, uh, in go excuse me, currently working towards goals that aid in our members' prosperity and economic growth of the municipality. We usually host more than 100 events each year in a normal year, which focus on the areas mentioned above. And this is certainly not a normal year, as everyone's aware. Our signature and annual events often feature local entrepreneurs and immigrants, post-secondary institutions, and prestigious business organizations. Each year we provide our members with the opportunities to hear the state of the municipality and province during luncheons and celebrate their successes at the business awards. As I mentioned, the Nova Scotia Association of Realtors is sponsoring this series of Meet Your Candidate webinars. And again, we'd like to say a big thank you to them for supporting this idea. I'd like to pass it now over to the Nova Scotia Association of Realtors uh, to welcome the crowd and say a few words. Over to you, Chris. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Ken. I appreciate that. Um, um, my name is Chris Peters. Chris, I am I going, going into my 10th year, year in real estate, real estate and, and I am, am the current, current president of the Nova Scotia, Scotia Association of Realtors. Of Realtors. The, Nova the Nova Scotia Association, Association of Realtors, Realtors is pleased to sponsor this series of Meet Your Event Candidates. NSAR represents over 1,600 salespeople and brokers across the province and we are the voice of real estate for Nova Scotia. Realtors are the ambassadors of our communities and often one of the first points of contacts for new residents to Nova Scotia. We know the communities we serve from the schools and recreation facilities to the service providers and commute times. We are your trusted guides. Realtors connect home buyers to potential cost savings and government programs, such as the first time home buyer incentive. And realtors play a key role in working with our elected officials to strengthen our housing markets. Realtors are also a key component of our local economy. In 2019, the average housing transaction through the NSAR MLS system generated an estimated $47,000 uh, in spin-off spending, totaling over $586 million in total spending in 2019. In 2019, MLS resale housing activity created an estimated 4,400 jobs right here in Nova Scotia. The real estate industry is a proud sponsor and a major contributor to our vibrant communities. But as you all know, housing has been in the news a lot lately. I in fact just did an interview last night on CTV News with regards to, to that key point. Inventory and vacancy rates are at extremely low levels in HRM. Without housing, our communities suffer. Housing is a spectrum from community, social housing to new builds. Realtors throughout the province believe that everyone should have a place to call home. That's why we are pleased to participate in this series of discussions to help, sh to help shape how our communities and our municipalities move forward. Every person on this call has an opportunity to work together towards making housing more affordable. From speeding up development permits to creating more rental spaces and encouraging backyard and secondary suites, 
we can all play a part in moving forward to build better communities together. Thank you to the Halifax Chamber for this opportunity to sponsor today's event. And thank you to each and every one of you candidates for putting yourselves out there and making yourselves available to be part of this election. With that, with, with that Kent, I'm gonna throw it back to you. Kent, you're on mute still, my friend. There we go. That better? There we go, sorry. Um, my wonderful friends here at the chamber muted me uh, without my knowledge. I think, I, I think there's some reason that it echoes in where I am, so I'll, I'll try and mute myself every time I, I, uh, I finish speaking. Um, thanks again, Chris. I'm sure we'll have lots of chances today to talk about affordable housing. It is certainly a, a big issue uh, within this election from uh, all the webinars that we've hosted so far. Also, some good news on the real estate front today. I saw, Chris, the, uh, that the local um, uh, Royal LePage, uh, I believe, or no, Remax, uh, that Remax was brought back into Nova Scotia hands, uh, the franchise from uh, a couple of guys in Newfoundland that had owned it for years. So uh, that's good news as well. Okay, uh, on to what we're here for today. So uh, for those joining us uh, on the webinar, uh, each candidate will have exactly three minutes. You'll see a clock come up on the screen to introduce themselves uh, and give a few reasons for running. Uh, and then we'll get into specific questions. Um, our questions will be a combination of those that have been previously sent to the candidates uh, and from you, our viewers. Uh, so um, please send us your questions in the Q&A or chat uh, section. Uh, and we'll do our best to get to them all. We may not get to them all, but if, if we don't get to them, we'll certainly be uh, emailing and sending the rest to our counselor uh, candidates uh, for follow-up. Uh, once we get to the question, question section, candidates will have one minute to answer each of those questions and we'll allow, uh, and, and I'll rotate through the candidates so that everyone has an opportunity to, uh, to ask those questions. Um, so at this point, we're gonna get started. Uh, and again, three minutes, uh, you'll see the clock there. And for folks uh, viewing, you can drag that clock uh, sideways to make the view screen of the person bigger uh, as you see fit um, and, uh, and adjust the size of that clock so it doesn't take up your whole screen. So John, uh, if you, uh, John Bignall, if you'd like to start, uh, we'd be happy to have you do so. Perfect, well, thank you very much, Kent. And Chris, uh, thank you for hosting this. I just recently went through uh, purchasing and selling our homes. So I understand the challenges that uh, COVID has presented to our communities and not only as a paramedic, but also as a small business owner in District 12. Uh, for me, looking at the challenges that we have in our community, this is really unprecedented time. I think we need true leadership. I think we need to have good communication. We need to be able to have good dialogue with our residents and make sure that businesses understand what's going on and understand the challenges that we face and the rules that we uh, have to implement from a healthcare perspective, but also from a taxation perspective. So I'm looking forward to collaborating, working, and making sure that District 12 is led with leadership and compassion and uh, hopefully move forward. Uh, I think we've been on pause and I really want to get us started again. Sorry, I wasn't on mute that time, but I'll try and remember it in case I'm echoing. Uh, thanks, John. Really appreciate that intro. Uh, Iona, over to you. <laughs> there we go. Well, there we go. Sorry about that. I'd like to thank um, the president and the Board of the Commerce for inviting me this afternoon to speak about District 12 and my position for councillor. Um, I've been in District 12 for over 22 years. I've raised my children here and they went to school here and I have a very good idea what is going on in District 12. The reason I ran for councillor was because of diversity. I think there is a lot of diversity in District 12 and we need to work with that diversity and appreciate it and be able to use it. Communication, that's one of the number one things on my platform. I think there is a lack of communication in District 12, and I believe that this is, at the very least, something a counselor should do. Um, return emails, return phone calls, um, any type of communication from the constituents should be returned in a reasonable amount of time. And even if you don't have the answers, the very fact that you've listened to the constituent and you've said, well, you know, let me look into this. Can you give me a couple of days? Could you give me a week? That gives them the opportunity to know that you have listened to them and you are willing to get back to them. Affordable housing is definitely on my list as we talked about earlier. 
untouched green spaces. Uh, Blue Water uh, Birch Cove is an, is an excellent area and an ex excellent example of wilderness land that should be a private park. I've, took a tour, I've taken a tour back there myself and it, you, you hear the city noise, city noise, and all of a sudden you see the, hear this pristine quiet and peaceful and it is so beautiful back there that everybody should have a chance to enjoy it. And finally, attention to small business. Um, I believe money should be put in the hands of those that are going to spend it locally. Um, there are a lot of people out of jobs and part, working part time and the money crunch is really on. And I think if we give opportunities to small business owners and entrepreneurs, they themselves can get their projects off the ground and help stimulate our economy. And if they get a little help, maybe financially um, from the government or anything that the government or the local um, constituents can do to support them would be a very good idea. And it will help them, it will help us, it'll keep our mom and pop shops open and uh, everybody will get to enjoy them for what they are. Um, you know, we do appreciate the big box stores, but we have to remember our small business and entrepreneurs. They need a hand up as well. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Appreciate that introduction. Uh, Lisa, over to you. Hi there. I think I've made it off of uh, mute here. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you so much to uh, to Kent and uh, to Chris for uh, for making this happen. Uh, I think I've met many of you in the room, but uh, if not, my name is Lisa Blackburn, and I'm the uh, the current councillor for District 14, which is Upper and Middle Sackville, Lucasville, and Beaverbank. I grew up in Beaverbank, uh, graduating from uh, Sackville High in 1986. I'll leave you to do the math. Uh, uh, got a, an honors degree in journalism from uh, University of King's College and uh, spent the better part of 25 years in, uh, in media as a reporter in radio, television, and uh, in print, uh, most recently with uh, CBC as uh, an editor with, uh, with them. So I had decades of experience telling the stories of Halifax, and that put me in a, in a good position to be able to enact change within the community. Now, for me, everything that I do is uh, District 14 focused. Um, you know, I was uh, presented with uh, the HRM Volunteer Award in 2015. Uh, my uh, community service included le leadership roles with uh, the Cobbacoot Community Health Center, Crime Stoppers, the MS Society, and uh, Beaverbank Kinsack Community Center, as well as some of the, uh, the local schools. So I am running uh, really on my uh, on my record because uh, since joining council in 2016 I've uh, certainly spoken out on diversity issues helping establish the first women's advisory committee at council uh, introduced bylaws dealing with uh, flyer distribution and vehicle booting uh, re-established the historic community boundaries of Lucasville and gave voice to uh, a number of other progressive initiatives that uh, that we've been working with uh, at HRM. So uh, that's, uh, that's basically the, the brief overview of, uh, of who I am. Uh, I've been voted to the position of deputy mayor in the last four years, which uh, has been uh, an extremely proud moment. And I'm also very proud of some of the things that we've accomplished in the last four years, uh, uh, including to uh, voting to support the findings of our Cornwallis committee, uh, I've been fighting for fairness in land lease communities and took the issue of uh, water meters in, uh, in trailer parks to the Utility and Review Board. Oh, is that my three minutes? No. Oh, that's somebody's <laughs> doorbell, is it? <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Oh, so, uh, and also, uh, you know, helped usher in a new era of uh, transit service with uh, expanded express routes on uh, very well in quite a few areas in the district. But I continue to work with uh, the community to get bus service to North Beaverbank and to Lucasville as well. So uh, I'm, I'm ba basically uh, back running for council because there are uh, some loose ends that I want to tie up. And uh, I think uh, another four years to finish what we started is, uh, is will be good for the community. Thank you, Lisa. Appreciate it. Uh, the last webinar we had, it was a cat that kept meowing. So, uh, Oh, was it? Okay. <laughs> you never quite know on a Zoom call what, uh, what you're going to get here. People are working from home. Um, thanks for that. Um, Mary Lou, over to you. Oh, you're on mute.
There we go. There you go. Not a genius at these things. Okay. I'm Mary Leroy. I'm a candidate for counselor in District 15. And this is who I am and why my values are important to me. Growing up in Sydney, my parents valued hard work and education. My father was a steel worker for 41 years and never missed a day of work. My mother was a home waker. I was encouraged to be the best that I could be. I was brought up to treat everyone with dignity and respect regardless of age, regardless of status, regardless of the color of their skin. I was taught to be of service and I've spent my life serving others. This began in earnest at an early age. My mother had a stroke when I was 12. As an only child, I learned about how disability affects a family, how hard it was to get help with no services available to our family. I care about you and I want to ensure that our government is creating programs and services that make your life better and easier. I want to make a difference in my community. I've graduated from Mount St. Vincent University and from Dalhousie University where I've obtained a Master of Public Administration. Over the course of this campaign, I have met many people in Lower Sackville and I hear your concerns. We have the largest food bank in Nova Scotia, Beacon House. People have lost their jobs during COVID. Senior citizens are having trouble on a fixed income, keeping up with the rise of costs of home ownership. People are struggling. I hear your concerns. They include an affordable place to live, support for seniors, creating jobs, traffic and speeding. Providing housing options that are affordable is a tall order in itself. All levels of government need to work together to resolve this. Programs and support for seniors remaining in their homes are essential. Subsidies for heating, property tax and utilities are very important to me. Thriving economy is important for HRM to grow. We must be open for business and encourage more companies to establish their headquarters in HRM. With a growing population and more cars, we have more traffic. I support the development of the 107 extension Sackville Bedford Burnside connector. I will, it will improve safety and travel times and divert traffic from many of the high congestion areas. Neighborhood traffic is an ongoing concern. Speed is the main problem. The speed limit of 50 kilometers is just too fast for neighborhoods and needs to be reduced. Although this is presently a provincial responsibility, I will work to ensure that HRM is given the responsibility of controlling speed limits within our boundaries. Sorry, Mary Lou, I had to cut you off there. You hit the three minute mark. <laughs> it it does take a little while to get used to, uh, no problems. I'm sure we'll have tons of time to come back to, uh, to some of the issues and some of your concerns. Uh, and certainly last but not least, Jay, uh, over to you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, really interesting to, to have a meeting in this day and age. Um, so a little bit about me. I was born and raised in Fall River, uh, and I've loved this community all my life. I live in Lower Sackville. I've lived here for over six years uh, with my small business. Uh, I'm an award-winning human rights activist and advocate in, uh, locally in the HRM, and as I said, a local small business owner and an involved community member and volunteer as well. I'm a social entrepreneur, so in 2014, I opened and uh, run a safe space drop-in for youth inside my comic shop, Cape and Cow Comics and Collectibles, on, lower, uh, on Sackville Drive in Lower Sackville. Through my business, I've created spaces, events, and initiatives with the aim to make the community a more inclusive place. I thrive on multi-sector collaboration and innovative thinking. I hold an honors degree from Dalhousie University with a focus on directing and leadership. And I've been using my voice for years. Uh, I'm a loud squeaky wheel for the things I believe in to uh, take on community activism to the next level. I think my enthusiastic personality and my compassion for people make me a natural problem solver. And I'm always willing to think outside the box uh, to address the issues that are important to the people in all HRM, but in specific Lower Sackville. I've been there time and time again for years to provide listening ears to the community members uh, in need who have sought my advice. Uh, so I feel like I've already been playing this role for a while and I'm ready to do this on a larger scale. Thank you. 
Thank you, Jake. Very much appreciated, and and uh, and very much appreciate the uh, the uh, conserving conservative use of time. It'll all, it'll come back to help us uh, at the end for sure. So again, thanks everyone for that introduction. Um, we're going to let uh, we're going to move into the question section, and and as I uh, as I said, uh, a, a minute for each answer, but I'll review that again in a second. Um, I'm going to go back to Chris at the Nova Scotia Association of Realtors, who's going to kick off the question and answer section for us. So over to you, Chris. Thanks, Kent. Um, and thank you to each one of our candidates. Um, your passion for your district is very evident and uh, good, good luck to each of you. Um, obviously coming from the Nova Scotia Association of Realtors, our question is gonna be about housing. Purchase and rental housing supplies are near historic lows in Nova Scotia. Housing is essential to our communities and our businesses. How will you ensure there is a healthy housing mix that includes the entire spectrum uh, from community housing to rental and home ownership. With that, Kent, I throw it back to you and the candidates. Great, Chris. Thanks. Appreciate it very much. And as I as I said to everyone, I'll, I'll jump around, but I'll make sure that I get to everyone for each question. So uh, so no worries there. Uh, Lisa, I'm going to start uh, that one with you, if that's okay. All right. That sounds good. Uh, all right. Well, I think ensuring a, a healthy housing mix. Is, is going to mean looking at housing from a holistic place. It means, you know, for me, uh, a housing mix, a healthy housing mix includes accessible housing, it means affordable housing, but it also means the availability of step-down housing for seniors. And that is something that we are lacking greatly here in District 14. Uh, we have too many of our community elders that are selling off their family homes after 40 years and moving to Larry Utec because there's, there's really no step-down housing for seniors. So in many cases, we're going to have to work with the province to reach these goals as housing is, uh, is under the provincial umbrella. But at HRM, we can certainly get programs and policies in place to support those goals. Uh, I see uh, the next four years continuing the work that we have started with secondary suites and allowing them in all areas of HRM and uh, also the uh, affordable housing fund that we have. Sorry, Lisa, <laughs> ran out of time. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, Iona, I'm gonna throw that one to you. There you go. Great, thank you. Um, just gonna read from a few notes that I have here. Affordable housing. Um, there was a time in my life when I was actually living from paycheck to paycheck, or rather from overdraft to overdraft. Looking back at this time, I could still count myself as privileged because I had the support of family, friends, and a great community. I understand having affordable amenities is something people with privilege and power can overlook for the disadvantage. As a counselor, I pledge to work towards more affordable housing, transit, and recreation. I will push for more projects that have affordable housing and reduce the permit time for these projects. In addition to that, I will insist that all new development contain a certain proportion of affordable units. The issues around housing and rental situation is complex because it involves all levels of government. It also involves non-governmental organizations, NGO, and the departments within government. However, I believe we could benefit from handling some of the provincial control over. I'm muted. Sorry, I own it. Um, you just went over the minute, so we uh, we had to cut you off there. Appreciate everyone's patience and and getting used to that that one minute timeline. It is it is tough, but there's a lot you can say in a minute. Um, okay, uh, Jay, uh, over to you. Thank you very much and thanks to Chris for that question. Um, affordable housing is very important. Uh, to resolve the city's affordable housing issues, we need to be working closely with all levels of government, the province and community groups as well, uh, who are on the ground delivering those programs right now. So we need to be able to consult those people who are there doing that work. Um, as a municipal council, uh, we are like the connectors, right? So we will connect the people to the different components of the decision making and, and bring people together like that. Right now, um, the HRM charter only allows us 
us to enter into agreements with the pro provincial and federal governments to deliver housing programs and services. So I think we should be fighting for changes to the provincial legislation that would see a transfer of power back to the city of Halifax to operate and deliver those programs because we are the ones here dealing with it. Every province is different and every city is different. Thank you. Thank you, Jay, appreciate that. Uh, John. Thank you for the great question. When I look at housing, as a paramedic, I travel to people's homes and I see every day the struggle that we have with housing and, and uh, our marginalized communities. And I, I go back to as we plan our communities and we plan our developments, I find we keep repeating the same mistakes over and over again, opposed to try and take the template and say, hey, these are the issues. And then as we build a new community, try to adapt and, and overcome those challenges, we just seem to use the same template over and over again. I realize as others have commented, we do have, this is a, a provincial issue, but I do think there's a role that the city can play in making sure that when we develop communities, that we develop them appropriately and with the, the mindset that there will be traffic, that there will be uh, public areas, there will be green spaces, there will be places where people that are struggling financially can fit into these communities. And I think that's what makes a community rich is by having diversity. And I think that's where we need to start. Great, John, thank you very much. Um, Mary Lou. So like being on the gong show. The Hollywood, HR squares. Plan huh? Hollywood squares. Yeah, exactly. The HRM planning department has to create an environment that is suitable for business and developers to provide the housing stock. The regional plan has to be specific and clearly state that all housing types must be developed in all areas. The plan must be set out and be well functioning and easily understood. Development agreements have to drive the creation of housing. HRM must stop selling density credits, period. I will work together with council and the planning department to ensure that development agreements include creation of all housing types in HRM and that we stop the selling of density credits. Wonderful, thank you, Mary Lou. Uh, did I get everyone on that question? I believe I did. Um, so the next question is, is one that was submitted to us from a viewer. Uh, and it's almost like uh, uh, someone uh, read my mind uh, because it links in perfectly to that last question. Um, so I'm gonna jump to that one right away. Um, so it says, uh, hello, we absolutely need affordable housing. Um, but we also absolutely need wild areas where development is off limits so that these areas can provide life-sustaining ecosystem services and add to the quality of life in Halifax. In which areas do you think our city should focus on creating or growing parks? All right, let's jump around a little bit. Um, Jay, do you wanna take a run at that one? Yes, thank you so much for that question. Um, green spaces are really important out in Lower Sackville here. We have the Sandy Lake and, and the, the Sackville Park um, that we've been trying to get the full amount. I believe that half of uh, the park has been secured, but we're trying to get the other half of that. There's many advocates in the area who are dealing with that. Walter Regan is uh, sort of my local Obi-Wan Kenobi who I consult with that. Um, but yes, green spaces are extremely important. We have to have a balance. Um, um, so I look forward to working uh, with the rest of municipality and uh, getting some more green spaces and protecting them. They're very important. Great, thanks, Jay. Uh, Lisa. Absolutely, and uh, to uh, sort of piggyback on what uh, Jay just said, uh, I think uh, you know we are we are certainly expanding Blue Mountain Birch Cove to uh, to the uh, where it needs to be. Uh, we're also working with uh, now on Lewis Lake so we can get that protected by the province. And Jay is absolutely right with Sandy Lake. I was just out there last week for, uh, for a hike and uh, to uh, learn more about that green space. So I think it's, you know, it's very important that we make sure that our reserve funds for land purchases is always at a robust level because uh, if for the example of uh, Blue Mountain Birch Cove, when uh, the Nature Conservancy of Canada came with uh, an offer that allowed us to uh, purchase land at 75 cents on the dollar, we've got to make sure that we have money available to you know, to really leap at those, uh, those chances when we get them because they don't come along too often. 
Great, thank you, Lisa. Uh, John. Going back to the 90s, when I first joined Rio, we built the Bluff Trail. That was something that was important for me because I saw the vision of parks in our community. When I think of joining the, the Five Bridges, Wilderness Heritage Trust, the Nova Scotia Nature Trust, and of course, Friends of Blue Mountain, uh, Birch Cove. These are all groups that I'm a part of that have been for many years. And I believe it's part of our community fabric. We need to have these spaces because it, we need a place that we can go to. And Blue Mountain Birch Cove has been a place that I've taken my family and my kids have grown up hiking and canoeing in these lakes. And it's part of the fabric that makes District 12 uh, so great. And I really feel that they're invaluable. Uh, when I look at these groups, when we first start, started talking about Blue Mountain Birch Cove and uh, taking the skills I had from developing the Bluff Trail with Rio, we really need to have leadership at the table. And I felt that's been a real misstep. And these spaces are needed in order to have good, strong uh, understanding of our communities because we need to have good leadership at the table. Great, John. Thank you very much. Uh, Iona. Oh, you're still on mute. And that is a great question. And I think for the purpose of our children and our grandchildren, we must have green spaces available. Um, as I once heard, they may be making more buildings, but they're not making more green spaces. And once our green spaces are gone, that's it. Um, I had an opportunity to have a tour at uh, Blue Mountain Birch Lake, and it was wonderful. As closer in as I got to Susie Lake, you could just hear the traffic and the noise just go and go until it was absolutely serene. I sat there by Susie Lake, and I was just amazed. It's so beautiful. And I'd like my grandchildren to be able to experience that same thing. I know there is a developer on one side of... Um, Birch Cove that's looking at that area and I say absolutely not. I would not support any development in that area. It's a beautiful place as it is and I'd like to see it there for a lot longer. We need green space, we need the trees, and we need the fresh water. Thank you, Iona. Hard to argue with that. Um, Mary Lou. Well, we have to do everything possible to ensure that Sandy Lake and Lewis Lake are protected. Uh, the Sackville River runs through a huge area and we need to ensure that all the areas around the river are protected. Uh, they've done an amazing job cleaning up the river and uh, restocking fish stocks and that kind of thing. It, it's, it's essential. Not enough can be said about it. And unfortunately, not enough is always done about it. Uh, from what I understand, a, a large portion of the area around Sandy Lake uh, has been purchased by a developer and we really need to look at that uh, when land is purchased that those areas are protected, number one. Uh, I'm also aware that there's a huge area of land around the present uh, rifle range uh, that when, when you look at it uh, from above Sackville, it is an incredible area. It includes a lot of the uh, the, the Sackville River, and apparently a lot of it is D&D &D land, and apparently when the, the, the rifle range is said and done, then it may be available for purchase. Sorry, Mary Lou, had to cut you off there. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you for answering that question. Uh, I'm sure our, our viewers uh, appreciate that very much. Um, so being the Chamber of Commerce, I'm going to move on to a bit of a more uh, selfish uh, question. Um, COVID-19 has had a great impact on our business community. How do you put the plan on supporting our businesses as we continue to live with the virus for an indefinite period of time? Um, let's start with Jay. Thank you very much. Uh, small business is close to my heart. I am a small business owner. Um, so I will advocate to uh, keep small business taxes low and work closely with business owners on individual plans for recovery. Um, uh, every business is individual, so every business would need an individual plan. Something that works for a comic book shop might not work for a restaurant and so forth. But I understand uh, as a small business owner that the challenges presented by COVID-19 is unique for every business. There needs to be a spectrum of government supports and services available to help businesses pivot and innovate during pandemic times for sure. Uh, 
So I am absolutely passionate about small business and I'm passionate about helping the other small businesses in my area in a number of different ways. Great, thanks Jay. Um, John. Thank you. That's a great question. When I look at COVID, certainly challenges are being faced with uh, healthcare and as a small business owner in Timberlake, I, I don't know if my business would have survived. We, we have a small business, my sister and I, we sold it a few years later. And in today's environment, I don't think we would have uh, been able to survive uh, to make it to the other side. So I, I understand the struggle of small business. I understand that every business is unique and every business has challenges that need to be addressed. And as a counselor, I'd want to make sure that I was available to communicate, to show that there's programs, to show the support, and to encourage businesses to uh, think out of the box and be entrepreneurs and find that entrepreneurial spirit that we all have and that we all need. And I think those are important skills in order to lead uh, through this challenge. You know, as small business owners, they're struggling right now. We need to support them. And as a counselor, that's where I would start by asking what can we do, how can we help, and what resources are available. Great. Thanks, John. Uh, Lisa, over to you. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Uh, great question. And the, th the key is, as a municipality, we may not have the ability to give grants to businesses, but what we can do is create an atmosphere where business has a chance to get back on the right footing post-COVID, and we want to give them that opportunity to thrive once again. So depending on the business, this is going to take many forms. It could include things like tax relief, eliminating fees, eliminating red tape to allow a smoother transition to reopening. Uh, the bottom line is that the solution is not going to look the same for every business. So we have to make sure that staff have the power to think and act outside the box on this one. Great, Lisa, thank you very much. Mary Lou. We need to have plans that will support business that can be flexible and be quickly implemented. Uh, business and government need to work together uh, to be strategic participants in this planning and I will ensure that the main stakeholders are always included in this planning. Wonderful Mary Lou, thank you very much. Uh, Iona. Thank you, that is a good question as well. I believe we should take our learnings from this pandemic and develop a strategy for future unseen emergencies. We can start by putting ourselves in a self-position, self-sufficient position and locally make our personal protective equipment, our PPEs, and sanitizers and non-medical masks ourselves. I also believe that entrepreneurs have had to adjust their businesses in many ways to survive. Uh, I have family members in the food industry and the um, entertainment industry that have had to basically rework their businesses in order to survive. And I think small business needs our support in any way we can give it. Wonderful, thank you, Iona. Couldn't agree more. Um, okay, I'm gonna jump back to a viewer question. So I hope everyone's had a quick chance to look at it. Um, I, and and I'll, I'll read it out. Uh, and again, I, I should have mentioned earlier that for those, uh, for the candidates, all the questions as soon as they're asked are posted on the chat. So if I don't repeat a question or you don't hear it clearly, you can certainly ask me to repeat it or, uh, or our staff here is, is putting the questions in the chat line as well. So this one is, uh, housing prices have been rising steadily over recent years which has caused an equivalent rise in the property taxes for residents. Will you support a, tr a drop in the municipal tax rates to ease the burden on the average homeowner? Okay, let's go, uh, let's go to uh, John to start. You know, whenever you talk about someone's money, uh, I think you really have to talk really about the value of this money. When you look at the city makes its money and offers services based on taxation, we need to be careful about not make sure we have enough money to provide the services we want and create value. So I'm not a fan of saying we're gonna raise or lower. I wanna say, I wanna make sure that people feel that they're getting value for their dollar and make sure they feel valued in their taxation. We should know that our money is not being abused and, and misused. We wanna feel good about investing in our city because our city can provide for us. We look at events and communities. As the, the founding member of the BLT Canada Day celebration, that brought business to the community that was a, a service that we were able to provide. We were able to use funding from the city, able to use funding from businesses, and coming together as a collaboration was a really great, uh, great thing. And 
I think it's about showing value, not about reducing or raising. And this time, pandemic, it's going to be really difficult to, to make sure that people feel they're getting the dollar value for the taxation that they're paying. Great, thanks, John. Uh, Mary Lou. I'm completely with John on this one. Uh, the main income for the city is property tax. So to say we are going to, although it, it seems like a wonderful thing, and certainly I would like my own property tax to be lowered, uh, it's the main income for the city. Uh, so I cannot say that I would uh, be supportive of a, of, a, of a drop in taxes because that's our income. Great, thank you, Mary Lou. Lisa. Thank you very, very much. And, you know, the thing is, no one really knows what the next four years is going to look like because COVID has really disrupted life as we know it and completely shifted our priorities. So we don't even know at this point what our fiscal picture is going to look like. We'll know by the end of the month because that's when the, uh, the tax bills are due and that's when we'll know, you know, what percentage of taxpayers have been able to pay their taxes this year. So you know, when we get that information, it will require an appropriate response. So, you know, at, at this stage of the game, I can't say one way or another. I will point out that HRM has been able to hold the line pretty much on taxes the last uh, the last four years without any huge uh, increases. So I, I think, you know, our, our path forward uh, is is unclear, but uh, certainly our uh, our track record is uh, is one that I'm proud of. Great. Thank you, Lisa. Um, Iona. Oh, you're still on mute. Hey. Sorry, I have these great conversations where nobody can hear me. <laughs> I think <laughs> taxes are very interesting. Um, they are the main income for the city. However, when you look at increasing them, you're gonna, you might just put somebody in a hardship. And when you look at decreasing them, you'll be looking at putting the city in a hardship possibly. So as good Nova Scotians and good Haligonians, um, I believe we have to look at all levels of government and organizations to see if we can equal out these payments um, and pull together in these times of trouble. And maybe those that have a little more to spare can do that. And those that can't spare it uh, are left with what they can pay. Um, I think anything can be affordable if we just put our minds to it and try to give to those who need it and perhaps, you know, tax a little bit more on those who can afford it. Wonderful. Thank you, Iona. And uh, certainly last but not least, Jay. Hi, thanks everyone. That's a really good question. Um, right, so I agree with Iona. This is kind of like a rock and a hard place. Um, it's uh, exactly that. I think it might be appropriate to maybe tax some people who could more afford it, but I'm in favor of exploring new approaches to taxation for sure. Again, we're in uncharted territories with COVID-19, but I believe residents and businesses should be taxed fairly and receive services that reflect the value of the taxes that they pay. Uh, we know that's not always the case. So I would potentially support tax reforms that make the system more fair, but I would need to see a significant level of public engagement prior to recommendations going forward. A lot of what I stand for is making sure that we consult the groups who are already dealing with this stuff every day. Um, so absolutely, I would look into it, but uh, also understand that we have been holding the line, as Lisa said, very, uh, very well so far. And so we need to tread carefully in these times and we'll know a lot Lot more in about a month. Okay, thank you, Jay. Um, so, uh, keeping on that vein, so while we're while we're thinking and and uh, about taxes, I'll, I'll I'll take that question, just turn it a little bit towards more of a business. Again, being the Chamber of Commerce, so more of a business view on taxes. Uh, and the municipality prior to COVID nineteen was working towards commercial tax reform. Do you believe our commercial tax system needs to be amended? And if so, how would you like to do so? Okay, let's uh, start with Lisa. 
All right. Thank you so much for the question. And yeah, um, you know, certainly this is something that we have been grappling with. Um, averaging commercial tax bills uh, could help a bit. You know, for example, any increases over 5%, you'd phase them in over three years, and that would give businesses, especially small businesses, time to adjust. Uh, some other options that I think I'd like to see explored is uh, tiered assessment rates or uh, maybe even the creation of new commercial zones. But, you know, that runs the risk of, uh, of creating a, a somewhat complex tax system. But uh, I think ultimately it would lead to a fairer system. Great, Lisa. Thank you very much. Uh, John. No, I know this has been a huge discussion and taxation is complicated by all means. And I think it's going to take strong leadership to sort of figure it all out and good dialogue with the other candidates, the other counselors, the other uh, staff members and bring everyone to the table and figure out the best way to do it. Having members of the chamber and other stakeholders at the table would be important to solve this problem. I know there's been discussions on having five different uh, tax zones. There's been discussions about uh, having urban versus uh, rural and downtown taxation, I really don't think we should complicate our taxes any harder. If I'm a new business owner, I want to open up a business, I want to know how much tax I'm going to pay. I think we need to have clear, concise taxation so I know exactly what I have to pay so I can plan and prepare for taxation, opposed to not knowing based on my location. I think those are really, uh, from my perspective, we need to make sure it's clear and concise, not create more red tape. Good, John. Thank you very much. Uh, Mary Lou. Well, there are two options in my mind, the property-based or the income value-based. If we shift the tax rate to income-based, that could be problematic for businesses. Uh, we need to engage in a comparative study that tells us how the tax burden would be handled by those left standing if we changed it. Uh, we need to understand the, the foundational shift that we will be making. And we need to have a conversation with business on how to go forward. I don't think we should be making any strategic changes without including uh, business and the, commerce, the Chamber of Commerce in those conversations. Great, Mary Lou, thanks very much. Uh, Iona. Sorry about that. Um, it might, might not be a distinctive distinction to new investigation investments. Maybe we could look at some of the money that we do collect and invest it otherwise. Um, possibly taxing more of the businesses that are in a, a positive position. And uh, I guess what I might say is just concentrating on the big businesses, more so on the entrepreneurs that are suffering as it is. There are many, many entrepreneurs that are caught in this rental agreement um, situation where they owe money for their rent and they're paying it back slowly. So I don't think they could afford any more taxes. Maybe the older businesses or the more established businesses could afford more taxes and make uh, things even out a little bit more and uh, help the city create a vibrant economy. Thank Great, you. Anna. Thank you very much. Jay. Hello again, everyone. Thank you for that. Um, yes, uh, tiered rates would be uh, something that I'd be interested in. Um, again, it would make it a little bit more complex to go through, but I believe it would make it more fair. Um, like I said before, I, I would support uh, tax reforms uh, that make the system more fair, but we would have to have significant consultation with the stakeholders on that. It's very important. Um, myself as a small business owner, I completely agree with what Iona was saying. I think we should focus on some of the larger businesses or the more established businesses and see how, uh, how we could progress there before uh, hitting the small businesses who it would be like kicking them while they're down. Fair enough, Jay, thanks very much. Okay, um, shifting gears a, a little bit um, on, on another uh, topic that, that's, that's very timely and, and critically important. Um, how will you ensure not just only diversity in your staff reports and project, but also inclusive feedback and collaboration? Um, let's see, uh, Mary Lou, would you like to start? 
Sure. It's necessary for the staff to reflect diversity as a group. Uh, human resources must have policies and procedures that have diversity as a foundation. Uh, there must be inclusive language and mission statements, policies and procedures. It's important to attract the interest of diverse and qualified candidates and then implement diversity and inclusive feedback and collaboration training for all management, staff, counselors, and mayor. Great, Marilu, thank you very much. Lisa. Thank you very much. And so now if you've, uh, if you've ever seen a report from HRM, you'll know that with every report, there's information and feedback on, you know, several things, including the financial implications of what the report contains, the environmental impact. Environmental impact, by the way, is uh, is one of the uh, the uh, rubrics that we just uh, had included with all of our reports within the last four years, uh, and also community engagement. They also tell tell us what community engagement was uh, was done in the uh, writing of the report. But I think now the time is right to make sure that a diversity lens is used as well. We have a diversity and inclusion office, and I think they should be one of the departments to weigh in on our reports before the CAO signs off on them. I think you know this may require some more staff for our diversity and inclusion office, but I think overall it, it's a move that is well worth it. Oh, thanks. Great, Lisa, thank you very much. Um, who did I miss there? Jay, sorry. Thank you so much for that question too. Um, diversity is uh, near and dear to my heart. I am an advocate for human rights. I am a, a trans person uh, myself. And so I, uh, I'm here for diversity and for uh, outside of the box thinking and some fresh ideas. Um, so I'm a strong networker and I am comfortable asking other people for their input and, uh, and suggestions and opinions um, because I believe everyone has something to offer. So as a leader, I'm very accessible. I use accessible language. Um, I, I make my spaces accessible to everyone and that uh, is not just physically accessible but accessible emotionally and uh, intellectually. Uh, um, and I think that this goes directly with understanding your community and the interest groups there uh, and in knowing what they need and how to, how to engage with them. It's a lot about reading the room and um, yeah, so I, I absolutely celebrate diversity and it is my commitment to make my teams and and um, and educate myself. Thanks, Jay. You were just close to getting cut off there. <laughs> you just got it in under the wire. Well done, uh, John. Well, when I look at the reports that are being created right now, there's always room for improvement. Diversity is is a discussion point. It's a lens that we all have to look at. And I think, as a most for the most part, when I think back and reflect on my career in business and my career as a paramedic, I look at how how the community has been challenged by, by the fact that we have, uh, or if my timer is not working. Oh, timer didn't come down. That's all right. Carry on. It had to be confused. I wasn't sure if it was off or on. <laughs> but going back to it, as a paramedic, I, I've seen the challenges that marginalized communities, uh, the poverty, uh, race, have played into people accessing healthcare. When I look at them not ac accessing healthcare and the challenges they face, it really opened my eyes that in business, what are the challenges? In society, what are the challenges? And I think we need to have make sure that these lenses are open and available and people are educated, that when we make decisions that they're not just random decisions, that they're looked at from a different angle, a different perspective. That's one thing I like about health acts that we have such diversity in our discussions, in our ideas, in our democracy. And that's something I've very much supported and uh, like to see more of in our community. For me, it's about bringing everyone together and collaborating and coming together with a conclusion. We may not always agree, but we can always talk about it. Great, John. Thanks very much. Uh, and lastly, Iona on that question. Thank you. When it comes to diversity in our staff reports, I believe diversity is a very important issue and should be used in all the language that the staff reports and projects um, appear in. I agree with Lisa's statement uh, that including our diversity inclusion department would be very helpful when putting out these reports and projects. Um, 
I also have a lot of friends and organizations uh, that would help keep me organized and make sure that my work is accessible. They would be able to show me ways that perhaps um, city staff or those involved in different projects maybe haven't thought that far. Um, diversity is something that everyone must be able to share. Diversity in mental health, diversity in healthcare, diversity in language, age, all of those and more should Thank you, Iona. Sorry, just went a little bit over time, but, but a great answer and, and, and much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, for that thought. Um, okay, I think we would everyone that question. Now I'm going to ask one from the, from the, uh, from the audience that, that's related to that one. Um, and I think, uh, you know, there, there may be a bit of an advantage here to someone who's been in council for a while. So Lisa may, may be more familiar with this than others, but I think we're all a bit familiar with this, with this question. So I'll, I'll ask the question and, and, uh, and certainly get some perspective from you folks. So, um, the question comes from a viewer, given Halifax's rich and diverse history and heritage, and a follow-up to Lisa's comment that she supported the removal of Edward Cornwallis' statue, and Lisa, you're certainly able to weigh in there. Um, what are candidates' position regarding the recommendation of Task Force on Commemoration of Cornwallis and Indigenous History? And I guess the question is really around, did the Task Force members present, do you feel the Task Force members presented a balanced, impartial, and objective assessment of the founder of Halifax? Or, or an, I think a more general question to, to lead in is, is, do you have an opinion about the task force on the commemoration of Cornwallis and the indigenous history of Halifax? Um, so Lisa, I think where you're mentioned there, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go in fairness to you just to, to start that. Sure, absolutely, and uh, appreciate the question. Uh, I think uh, I was uh, I was pretty clear about this at, uh, at council when, uh, when I spoke. Uh, the uh, I, I was very satisfied with the uh, with the report that came back. I think it was uh, balanced in that it uh, it looked at uh, you know both the uh, the British occupation of uh, of this area. Uh, it looked at the history of uh, of the uh, the Mi'kmaq people, uh, and I, I think that it was uh, it was fair and uh, and just struck the right balance for uh, where we need to go. It uh, it set the roadmap. Uh, and uh, now it's our job as as a council to uh, follow through on the recommendations. Great, Lisa. Thank you. Really appreciate that, um, Jay. Thank you. Um, yes, I also appreciate that question. Uh, as I'm not a sitting member of council, I did not see the full report that the task force uh, put out. Um, but uh, I do support that the Cornwallis statue was taken down. And I would love to read that further. And uh, I just, I support a, a more well rounded understanding of our history and uh, the people who were here first. And uh, I, I suppose that's all I can say on that for now. But I look forward to answering more questions once I've had a better look at it. No, that's fair. And, and, and I think, yeah, I, and that's kind of the lead in I, the impression I wanted to give that, yeah, not everyone would have had a chance to see it, but certainly most people have an opinion on somewhat on, on this issue. So uh, Mary Lou, thanks. I certainly supported the uh, removal of the Cornwallis statue. And of course, now we find out it wasn't even his likeness. So that's interesting. Um, the task force, I think, was very, very good. I was satisfied with the report. It had a good uh, overview of the issues. And uh, like Lisa, I think we need to explore now how to follow its recommendations. Great, Mary Lou, thank you. Do you know whose likeness it was? They haven't said. <laughs> OK. Uh, John, over to you. For me, I look at uh, my involvement with the Nova Scotia Agricultural, Nova Scotia Archaeological Society. As a board member, I love history. It's been a part of my life for a long, long time. We're currently preserving a, one of the oldest surviving Nova Scotia ambulance. So there's a lot of work I'm doing in history. I love history. But right now, we're in a pandemic. We have people that can't find a place to live. We have businesses that may not be here in a year. Why are we talking about the past right now when we should be looking to the future and dealing with the issues that we're dealing with right now? I welcome the staff report. I welcome the feedback. I love to implement a lot of the suggestions and ideas, but really I don't want to spend any more money discussing a statue that doesn't even look like the man who it represents and when we have real issues that are in our community, in our society that need to be addressed. Businesses need to be looked after. 
residents need to be looked after so they can have employment, or we won't have a city to look after or put more statues up. And I think that's the real question. What will 2021 look like? And really, is it about statues at this time? And I think there's another priority that we need to focus on. Great, John. Thank you very much. Uh, Iona. Hi, that is a really good question. I do, I did support the removal of the statue and I look forward to reading the staff report. However, I don't believe we should make any judgment calls on before I read that report. Um, I believe strongly in our indigenous people and I believe they deserve respect. And until I can read this full report, I don't believe I can make a proper judgment on this particular point. Thank you. I know that's very fair. And I think I think that's a that's a great answer. Appreciate that. Okay, um, a couple more and then and then we'll we'll clue up. Um, and this one, uh, this one we hear quite a bit being a being a business advocate here at the chamber, but um, as well intentioned as municipal staff are. We're aware that many of council's asks and reports, and in our case, permitting, et cetera, take a considerable amount of time. What will you do to speed up the processes of, of uh, the municipality? Uh, oh, sorry, Iona. We'll jump back to you if you're okay answering that one first. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Absolutely, I apologize for that. I think I went on mute there. So again, as well-intentioned as municipal staff are, we're aware that many of council's asks and reports, and in our case, sometimes permitting, take a considerable amount of time. What will you do to speed up the process of government in the municipality? That's a good question. Uh, maybe we could look at streamlining the process a little more. Um, maybe some background information that we already know does not need to be um, readdressed in the staff report. Perhaps they may streamline it a little more by um, not going into, um, I guess, things we are, like I said, things we already know. Um, I guess go strictly to the point, if I could be, uh, if I could say that. Um, some of them are wordy, and uh, I think a lot of the words aren't necessary if they could be streamlined in such a way that, you know, you, you get to the point, you know what the situation is, you know what the conclusion is, you know what the money will be spent, you know what the um, counselors are looking for, and put, put it together in a little package and give it to council. So the council don't have to spend a lot of time reading it as well. So it's a win-win for both. Great, thank you, Ayana. Uh, John. I think in District 12, we are electing a leader, a leader that can go to council, make decisions, make uh, tough choices. And I think we're looking for someone that can have that ability. It's easy if we have a tough subject to ask for a staff report. And it's a kind of a, a note for a lot of, uh, Love City staff because it allows it to push over to staff. Staff recommended it. I think we need leadership. I need. I think we need someone that can actually make decisions and be held accountable to those decisions. I think those are important. And when you ask for a staff report, you're kind of pushing it over to someone else's ideas saying, hey, can you look into this for me? I really think we need to make decisions at council. And as a counselor, I would be the one saying, you know what, I want to vote on this now. I want to move forward based on what I'm getting from my feedback from the community, from the businesses and we can vote on things, we can move it forward. I, don't, I always question, do we really need to have a staff report on everything? Because people elected me, not the staff report. Great, John, thank you very much. Um, Lisa. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the last couple of years, HRM staff have been asked to produce some pretty heavy and complicated reports. And I'm thinking about things like Halifax 2050, the Cogswell uh, District, the review of the regional plan. And that's the type of stuff that takes up a lot of time and a lot of hours. So we may have to look at expanding our workforce in some of the busier departments to make sure that reports are returned to council for decisions sooner. Uh, when it comes to reports, unfortunately, you know, we are, we are mandated by the, by the charter that uh, a lot of these things that we do require a staff report. 
Uh, so, you know, if that's perhaps a, a change that needs to be made, I am all for uh, the province loosening the uh, the reins a bit on municipalities and giving us more power to uh, to take care of ourselves. And uh, that's certainly something that I would uh, that would, I would look into. Uh, and and with that, I do have to excuse myself because I have another meeting that starts at 3:45. So, uh, I just want to say thank you so very much to uh, everybody at the chamber for giving us this opportunity. To the, uh, the other candidates, uh, the best of luck to you guys. I would be proud to sit next to any one of you at council and uh, look forward to, uh, to uh, toasting your success on the, uh, on the 17th of October. Thank you, Lisa. I really appreciate you coming and, and uh, good luck. Sorry, I muted myself. There you go. Um, okay, um, Mary Lou. Well, I have to say I'm with Iona on this one. I'm a business owner and I know in my own businesses over the years, uh, a lot of time has been wasted when I haven't been as clear and concise as I could have been to the staff when I've been looking for uh, reports. So the key is prioritizing and clarity. Be sure that the staff are taking the direction that the council understood they wanted when uh, we were all at the council table. Or is it a matter of not having enough staff? You know, with 16 councillors making requests, how many staff members are there? I, I don't know that. Uh, so I would certainly look at uh, the staff complement and uh, we'll ensure that uh, the numbers are sufficient to do the work that has to be done. It's a huge amount of work. Great. Thank you, Mary Lou. Uh, Jay. Thank you for this question as well. Um, so I can work to keep myself informed and ensure that I'm updated on publicly available resources so that we can cut out some of those things so I can just make sure that I'm already informed. Uh, my team so far has been pretty good at doing that for me. Um, and I agree that things should be less wordy, more to the point, what Iona said. Um, we need to make the language more accessible so that when it's coming to the table, we understand it to the point and can move on uh, as quickly as possible. Um, and then also I want to say that John had good points about uh, electing us, not the staff reports. So yeah, that just that we could be more concise with this. A lot of people know I'm a get it done kind of person. So I will always be loud and in favor of, okay, let's get to the point and then let's do something about it. <laughs> Great, Jay. Thank you very much. Okay, just, I'm going to sum up with this last question because I think it's important to give you guys all sort of a, an opportunity just to, just to you know, to, to summarize uh, your point of view. So the last question is a fairly simple one. What are your priorities for the next four years and how do you plan on achieving them? Um, and, uh, and then we'll wrap up uh, after that question. So um, Jay, I'm, I went last that time. I'm gonna start with you if that's okay. Very good, thank you so much. Um, so a lot of what people have known me for and what I've said is my platform so far, my priorities are accessible housing, affordable housing, accessible and affordable transit, youth engagement uh, and safe communities. So I'm gonna start by working to establish stronger connections with federal and provincial partners in order to better collaborate to resolve complex housing and other uh, issues. I will work closely with the community to ensure housing needs of diverse populations and that those are met uh, and we will aim to provide a spectrum of housing solutions that are innovative and sustainable as well, which is very important. I will advocate for investments in our transit system that will actually be put to work for the people who use the public transit every Every day. I will work uh, closely with community-based organizations to come up with multi-sector collaborative solutions uh, for issues of our youth homelessness, uh, particularly in Lower Sackville. And uh, this is all on my platform, but uh, absolutely anyone can uh, message me if they want more clarity. Thank you, Jay. Appreciate that. And I know a minute is hard to sum up your whole platform, but uh, you did a pretty admirable job there. Uh, Mary Lou. Well, there are a lot of things that, uh, that are important, but my priorities are housing, housing, jobs, and jobs. If I can create both of those, I'll be very, very happy. Uh, more housing starts with our, our planning department. I'll work with the planning department to ensure that development agreements include a variety of housing types. We've created a culture of selling affordable housing units for density credits, and that needs to stop. I am adamant about that. Jobs, I'll do everything I can to draw new business to our area and help create an environment that's attractive and enticing. 
Great, Mary Lou. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Iona. Hi, thank you for that question. Um, I developed my platform based on personal observations and from listening to my fellow residents in District 12. My number one issue or number one thing that I'm going to do on my platform is communicate. There's been a lack of communication in District 12 to the point where there's no response from the current counselor when returning emails, telephone calls, or anything of that, um, anything along that lines. Uh, members are frustrated, and I want to make communication one of my number one focuses. Inclusivity and diversity, as said, um, District 12 is very diverse, and uh, I need to make sure that women of color experience uh, women of color are a minority at the person at the present time and are not represented in groups or organizations with with power. My life experience has made me a perfect bridge between these types of stuff people. Um, I was raised by a single mother and I witnessed the hardships of being a single parent. Affordable housing again is on my list as I explained. Sorry, Iona. <laughs> That was a quick minute, I know. It, it, like I said, it's hard to sum up a platform in a minute, but I'm, I'm sure your platform is available to those who, uh, who want to read more. So thank you very much for that. Uh, last word to you, John. Thank you. I don't want people to vote on what I'm going to do. It's easy to offer promises and ideas. I want people to vote on what I've already done in the community. As a paramedic in the area for the last 26 years, as a volunteer in the area for the last 26 years, for me, it's about what I've already done. So it comes down to communication. I've improved on communication by writing articles in the two local newspapers every month, trying to focus on issues around District 12. When it looks at diversity, I've been active on the Nova Scotia Archaeological Society. When I want to bring in public archaeological digs into Beachville and actually go into the community where the first generation of refugees arrived in Beachville and settled and raised their families. And that's all still there. It's not touched. It's unpreserved. It's all preserved and never been researched. And I think there's a, a great opportunity there to bring the community together and actually look at, at these sites and figure out what and how they're used, the different farmsteads. So for me, it's about not what I'm going to do. It's what I've already done and how I can use those skills and experiences to bring it to the future. And uh, as a counselor, be able to do more from building the bluff trail help bring those skills to Blue Mountain Birch Cove. I think we need to have leadership on that file. So diversity, communication, and building parks. I want to do more in the community because I've already done a lot in the community as a volunteer, and I hope to take, take it to the next level. I think we've been on pause. Great, thanks, John, appreciate that. Um, so I think we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Um, we answered all the questions of our viewers, and, and you know, I just, uh, I just want to say thank you to you folks uh, for participating today. Thank you for running um, and thank you for giving uh, the viewers and our, our members here at the chamber uh, an opportunity to ask you questions on a personal level and get to know you a bit more. Um, I know my key takeaway, I think, from these webinars that we've been running is how much work it is, um, how much respect I have for everyone who's running, and, and how difficult, if, if you actually get to know the candidates, how difficult a choice it's going to be for, for the constituents, because the people that are running are high quality uh, right across the board. So I've, I've been extremely impressed and I've, I've learned a ton uh, just doing these webinars. So again, a big thank you to our sponsor, uh, Nova Scotia Association of Realtors, to Chris and his team, um, and, and for the opportunity for us to promote the importance of voting and hearing from the candidates. Um, for those watching, please keep an eye on your bulletin and our social media as we'll have and continue to post uh, candidate responses to some of these questions. Uh, on that note, again, a great big thank you to you all. Um, have a great rest of your week, and uh, we appreciate uh, we appreciate your time. Good day, everyone. Thanks. Good luck, everyone. Good luck. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.